All right. Hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online, Sales Magazine and Pipeliner CRM coming to you from Blue Sky, San Diego as usual. And today I'm joined by Colonel Dr. Russ Barnes, who is in Florida. How are you doing, Russ? I'm doing great. It's uh, wonderful to be on the show. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And and Russ has got a phenomenal background, you know, with uh, 27, was it 27 years in the uh, in the Air Force? That's correct. Yeah, and I've noticed when I was reading up on you, some, you know, fascinating, you've spent time at different uh, ministries of defense around the world, mm -hmm. etc. So Romania, Bulgaria, and all of that. So that's fascinating background. And now you are the founder of Sistro Business Strategy for Small Businesses. And what we're going to talk about today is the principles for purposeful profitability. Um, so, you know, people might understand if I just said the principles for profitability, but what's the purposeful, what does purposeful profitability mean? That is uh, what drove me into this line of work, let's say. Uh, when I retired from the military and I knew I didn't want to work for anybody anymore, my intent was to be a business owner, take control of my future, be in charge of uh, the outcomes that, that I would want to have in my life. And having served 27 years in the military, we are very intentional about what we do because we can't fail in national security strategy. You know, this is what determines the freedom of our country. So as I began to walk down that path to become an entrepreneur, it was a lot of trial and error involved and people were guessing and they were sort of making it up as they went along and and people told me that luck is based on persistence i mean that success is based on persistence and luck and i just thought that uh there had to be a better way and so as i started to try to figure my own path i said there has to be something intentional and purposeful about what we do something deliberate and that's how I came up with the purposeful aspect of becoming purposeful profitability. Yeah, and, and it's interesting, obviously, as you say, from your background uh, in the military, relying on luck is probably not the greatest military strategy out there, right? So <laughs> you, you, have to, you have to be very purposeful, intentional in, in what you do. But you're correct, though, in business, a lot of people do kind of rely on luck. That's correct. You know, it's funny in the military, we used to say hope is not a plan. Mm -hmm. um, when we uh, start out in business, we start out with a lot of passion and a lot of uh, ex excitement about being in control of our future. And we don't really sit back and take the time to sort of map it out and say, well, what is this going to look like? And you don't really, when it comes to purposeful profitability, you don't have to have all the details. It's not about, you know, I have to you know, make this thing uh, precise. And if I don't have precisely what I want it to look like, then I can't proceed. It is actually just the opposite. When I retired, I said, I want to be an entrepreneur. And that was my goal. But that was all I knew. But that was all I needed to know. Because by knowing that, I could then say, OK, who are entrepreneurs? What do they do? How have the ones who are successful become successful? What do their paths look like? And then I could start to figure out, OK, based on my personality, based on my resources, based on my skills, talents, and abilities, let me see how I can then position myself to walk a path modeled after those who have been successful. And as you start walking down that path, you then gain more clarity as you go along because you now are not worried about going from A to Z, you're just worried about going from A to B. Well, let me get to point B. And as I get to point B, I learn a little bit more, I'll see a little more clearly, I'll get more people on my team, and then you just continue to progress in that fashion. Yeah. Um, I, think, I think Martin Luther King said, you know, when, you, when you're when approaching the staircase, you don't need to see the top of the staircase. You just need to see the first one. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But the point that you made there is an interesting one, though. It's like you, you first of all, you figured the destination. And I think that that's a lot of people don't take a step back and, and think about, you know, what motivates them, what do they want to do. I mean, somebody once said, I mean, if you're going down a, if you're going, if you want to go to uh, Hawaii on a vacation, right, you don't visualize all the steps to getting there. You visualize yourself sitting on a beach with some umbrella drink in your hand or whatever it is you want. And then you figure out, okay, I need to save up the money. Uh, I need to get an Uber to the airport, all of that stuff. But you have to have that 
you have to have that vision of where it is you want to go first. Exactly. You know, you kind of choose the appropriate vehicle too. You know, if you go to Hawaii and you live in a continent the United States, you're certainly not going to choose a car uh, right. to get there. You might choose a boat. You will probably most certainly choose an airplane if you have the resources to, to take an airplane because you get there a lot quicker and you're on the beach with your Mai Tai a lot faster. Uh, but it's the same in business, you know, you kind of say, okay, this is where I want to be. And then you have, you have to choose the appropriate vehicle to get there. I mean, if you want to build a multi-million dollar company, then you're going to have to have some type of leverage that's going to enable you to uh, scale fairly rapidly so you can get there. But if you just want a lifetime business or a lifestyle business, then you don't need such a powerful vehicle. Yeah. And I think a part of it is what, what you were outlining there is having these principles or, or a framework because I do think mm -hmm. when when people start their own business sometimes like it's very easy to be running around like a headless chicken right is mm -hmm. in many different directions and, and just think oh I've got to do a bit of this I've got to do a bit of that and, and then run over here uh, and and it's very chaos comes very quickly yes it does <laughs> chaos and crisis what's interesting about that is uh, there is this the mindset of being in business too and you know, some people become their business. Their identity is wrapped up in their business. And, and I'm sure as you are well aware that in order to achieve prosperity, you have to take sort of a, a step back at times and say, you know, I know I need to do these things and these things may be difficult and tough for me to do. Um, but if you are just focused on your identity, then your daily routine becomes, I need to put out fires. I need to solve problems. People are depending upon me to uh, bring them the answers. And as a leader trying to move an organization in a direction, you're spinning your wheels. You tend to, you know, just spin your wheels. You get frustrated. You get, you know, anxious. You're haphazard in your processes and your approaches. And so, you know, this idea of purposefulness, you know, towards prosperity really is, um, wrapped up in your in your pers your perspective and and with obviously with your with your um air force background and that is you have an air you know you have an aircraft right but there are so many different people who play roles in that air aircraft taking off and being able to fulfill its mission and obviously the key is to find the right people for the right tasks that's right. And I happened to be on a crew airplane. So there were six of us on the crew. We had the pilot, the co-pilot, the radar navigator and the navigator, the electronic warfare officer and the gunner. And we all had our roles. And you could tell the really good crews because it was quiet in the airplane because everyone knew their role. They were doing their role and they only said the things they needed to say in order to make sure that they were getting uh, to where they needed to go. You know, as an evaluator, which I was uh, when I was on the, when I was in the aviation community, and I went to evaluate a crew, the ones that talked the most and the noisier the crew, the more difficult I knew they were going to uh, be at the getting to you know the outcome that they were tasked with. Yeah, and I think that's a fascinating point because what you said about the quiet crew is that obviously they know what they're doing and they're accountable to themselves, right? They're taking personal accountability for their role. And I think that's that's something that in business people often struggle with is, is uh, you know, grabbing onto their role and then taking personal accountability for everything that happens because it is very easy to get noisy and to start to uh, you know, point fingers or whatever when, when that crisis comes, which it inevitably will. Oh yes, it definitely will. And, and it is the same. And when I started down this path, um, actually close to, I don't know, seven, seven, eight years ago, I would talk to business owners about organization. And it was something that they weren't interested in because their idea was, well, if I become organized too much, I lose my creativity, I lose my flexibility, right. I lose the ability to pivot. And it actually turns out to be just the opposite. Mm -hmm. Because when you can see where your destination is and you have an idea of what that looks like and you start to chart your path, you can tell when you're getting too far away from the center line and you can make corrections. You know, when we're driving down the road in our car, we don't just hold the steering wheel straight and go down the road and stay on the road. We won't. We'll drift off into the ditch on the side. 
we make minor adjustments. We're continually making minor adjustments. And that's where you still have the creativity, but the creativity is contained within certain boundaries. And so when you know you're, you're starting to hit the edge of the boundary and everyone knows where you're going, now instead of the chaotic conversations and the, and the conversations born out of crisis, you're actually having uh, conversations that are productive saying, well, if we continue to go down this path, we're going to end up off course. Let's try to make an adjustment. What does that adjustment look like? And now that creativity kicks in, but everybody's thinking along the same lines. And you'll still have all the same arguments. You'll still have all the same disagreements. None of that will change, but your effectiveness will be a little bit better. And, and it's right, because what you say there sometimes is people, uh, you know, call what they call creativity is often just a lack of discipline. Uh, and process is actually a friend. And to be honest, when you get your processes right, it actually, as you've just pointed out, it just allows you to be more creative, but within a framework, because just being creative with no process, as I said, is just, is really covering up from a lack, for a lack of discipline. Yeah, it is. And, and it, it comes down to a matter of control. Again, like your identity and, you know, I want to be the one who's making decisions. So, you know, do it my way or we're going to argue about it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a big challenge, obviously, in leadership as well, is, um, is that idea is when you do hand off things to other people to do or you bring in somebody to do it, uh, sometimes you have to accept the fact that they're not going to do it exactly the way you would do it. But if they get the result, then you have to be kind of okay with that. You know, I've been in very high uh, profile leadership positions, but I've also been in positions where I was not the the leader, the, 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 the person with the formal authority. And so I had people who were telling me what they wanted to be done and what they wanted me to do. And I had to come up with a rule for myself. And the rule for myself was, I'm going to do the best I can to get the outcome that we have decided that we need, that we know we need to get. But if you're going to look over my shoulder and tell me exactly how to do it, it doesn't make sense for both of us to be in that space because you can do it and I can do it, but you have to trust me that I'm going to get it done. So my rule became, you know, you can either, I can either do it your way or you can do it yourself, mm -hmm. you know, and I, I just had, I, and, and I had to stand by that as a follower because it just didn't make sense to, you know, yeah, to try to do it the other way. And that's a great point that you're making, that idea of kind of managing upwards, uh, because we always, when people think about management, they're always thinking about managing people, the people that report into them or that they have responsibility for. But there's two other types of management. There's the management of yourself, which is probably the most important part, but there's also the management upwards. And what you're talking about there is, is if somebody hands, you know, if your manager hands you a task to do, and then they're gonna look over your shoulder, your first job is to say, okay, well, let's sit down and talk about this because this isn't going to work. That's right. That's right. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and so, yeah, and when you, when you can do that, it provides some confidence in your leadership as well because they know, now know that you have the confidence to get it right. They know that they can check in with you periodically to find out how you're progressing and where you are in that process. But then they begin over time to trust you to say, okay, I know they're not going to do it my way, but I know whatever they come up with is going to be uh, suitable and effective for what we need to have achieved. Yeah, and, and I'm pretty sure you have seen this with the, with the clients that you've worked, uh, worked with and people you interact with is that during this uh, you know, COVID crisis, the people who have a, a good framework who are disciplined, who are purposeful and intentional are probably faring a lot better than those who aren't. They are, absolutely. And the reason is because they had the ability to anticipate. Um, because they know where they were going when the crisis hits you in business all the time. Mm -hmm. COVID is just another crisis that might have hit you and it's of a particular form that means that you can't be face-to-face -face with your clients or you can't be in their space in order to work with them. So because you know where you're going, you know what your desired outcomes look like. You have a sense of what you need to accomplish on a day-to-day -day basis in order to get there. Now you just change your approach. And you say, okay, if I cannot be face-to-face, -face, how can I still communicate and solve the problems and help the people that I've been working with achieve their outcomes through a different method? 
and the method, one of the methods became this, um, you right. know, online, online face to face, so to speak. My business transitioned very smoothly um, because I'd already been using Zoom with certain clients who were out of town and I couldn't get face to face with them. So when the social distancing came in, it just became 100% of my interactions with my clients became, you know, Zoom. I was most concerned that Zoom would not be able to um, handle the magnitude and the increase of people who were using it, but they did a superb job. I, I had very few glitches in the transition and it was very smooth. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I guess that's another thing that, um, you know, lessons that uh, for us who weren't in the military, but can take from the military, because that, that's it. I mean, very rarely do the, your best laid plans, does it all go according to plan and your ability in, I mean, I think that's the thing that really marks out, you know, the, the military is the ability to be able to pivot or to tweak things kind of on the fly. And so in the military, we have another thing. I got tons of and this one is uh, no plan ever survives contact with the enemy. Mm -hmm. So I make the plan because it's important to have the plan. But once you've got the plan, then you have to you know, go into this thing in a realistic uh, situation and be ready to adapt, adjust, modify, and do things that are going to help you stay uh, in line with what you want your desired outcome to be. And some people will say it's not the plan that is so important, it's the planning. And I spent years in the military uh, in, the, in planning, you know, pretty much when I was in that, um, you know, captain major uh, rank, where I was actually, you know, sort of the, the, the hands-on guy doing the, the actual planning. And when you do planning on a daily basis, you begin to think in a certain way. And so when you get into a volatile situation or, you know, that, that type of, of chaotic situation, that planning mindset still seems to take effect because you look at your environment, you make some assumptions, you take those assumptions, you bring to bear what knowledge you have uh, already accumulated, and then you begin to apply those in a methodical way, and you just get faster and faster and faster in planning on the fly. And I think that's a and I think that's a huge lesson for for people in business because, I mean, you know, traditionally people have, you know, they've done plans once a year or they've done their you know back in the old days it used to be five year plan then it came down to three year plans then it was sort of yearly plans now the thing with being faced with this crisis it's like thirty and sixty day plans maybe ninety day plans if you're feeling really confident in yourself, um, but to your point. Uh, you have to get used to this continuous planning and then the modifying and the adapting. Yes, yeah, continuous planning, continuous improvement, adjustments. And that's why um, people who have been in the military actually make very good entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. Who have not been in the military have this perspective that military people are told what to do, you take orders. That is true when you're sort of a first term, you know, airman or first, you know, first term lieutenant, because you are learning and people do have to tell you what to do. But once you get past those initial stages and you understand the environment, you become a supervisor, you become a leader, you become the person who is responsible for outcomes and you have to then be adaptable. And the longer you stay in the military, the better you become at becoming part of a high performance team, working with people who are moving really fast in an environment that changes very quickly. So when someone comes out of the military, if they spent five years or more, they're very well positioned to be an entrepreneur. Absolutely. I mean, I would say, and for people like yourselves who've been through combat, I would say that uh, prepare, you know, nothing that gets thrown after, at you afterwards can obviously compare with that. And I tell you what, that really taught me a huge lesson in training. Because we had, and I was a B-52 Radar to Navigator, and we would train in this exercise we call Red Flag. So we'd fly down to the Nellis Range, and we would simulate combat to the best of our knowledge and understanding of how the next war was going to be fought. Mm -hmm. When I flew my very first combat mission, it was a low-altitude mission, and uh, I was amazed at how much it sounded exactly like Red Flag. I, I absolutely couldn't believe it. I was like, how do we get this so right? And the that went through my mind was that the only thing about this mission is if we get 
shot down, I won't be going home to talk about it. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. <laughs> a different, different outcome. Um, Absolutely. So, and so it also brings that, so that training is something that I bring in terms of purposefulness as well, because you can really train people when we all know what those skill sets are that are needed to get to the desired outcome that we've set for ourselves. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I couldn't agree more. And I think there's some fantastic lessons here for people to take away. So we're bumping up against the end of our time. So all of your information, um, Russ, will be in your contributor bio below this video. Well, please, before we go, do tell people a little bit more about yourself and your company and what you do. So Sistro Solutions, as I mentioned, was born out of the uh, um, desire to help business owners in the pre-profitability stage uh, to become intentionally and purposefully profitable. And the idea was to create the frameworks, which I did through, uh, actually through my PhD. Mm -hmm. uh, PhD is in organization development and the uh, dissertation was organization design for small business, a discovery of basic fundamentals for executing a purposeful path to profitability. So what I do with Sistro is evidence-based and it's based upon people who have been successful from zero to $100 million in annual revenue. Uh, I studied 75 of those companies and really began to dissect and pull it apart. So that is the foundation. I bring those principles to the small business owner in a way that they can take action on those programs. And so with the uh, Purposeful Profitable program, I also put together the podcast because I wanted to share that information. I have a book called um, Small Business for Service Members, 15 Things You Need to Know to Be Purposefully Profitable. And uh, I can actually easily be reached at russ at sistro.org. That's my website, www.sistro.org. Well, this has been fantastic. Thank you, uh, Colonel Dr. Russ Barnes. Uh, quite a phenomenal background you have and obviously um, a great service that you're providing now for for small businesses, uh, much needed, and I think bringing great, uh, great, great uh, framework and, and you know a track to run on for people. I, I want to say one more thing very quickly, yes. a moment, and that is, in order to be successful in your business, the money aspect is incredibly important, but the meaningfulness aspect of it has to be also part of that because money will only take you so far. Some people are highly motivated by money, and that's okay. That mm -hmm. will. But most people are not. So you have to make that, put that combination together. And so in that purposefully pro profitable uh, approach, you know, I want to make sure that I, I get that message across because that is so critically important. Yeah, no, I, no, I love that as well, because you're right. I think um, because when the going gets tough and all of that, it's, uh, it's not really the money part that's going to keep you in the game. It's, it's the motivation, what's in the intrinsic uh, value that you're getting out of this. Exactly, exactly. All right, well, listen, thank you very much. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online, Sales Magazine, Pipeliner, CRM. I'll see you off for another expert interview really soon. And fascinating, uh, fascinating, Russ. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. It was my pleasure to be on.